Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is audio engineer Lee Brankman. Uh, Lee's got a, a lengthy and very interesting history. He's, he, I guess, let's let's start with that. Let's start with just a little bit of background. You have done live sound primarily for a great many years, starting with, I guess, as far as I know, the Family Dog and the Avalon Ballroom, and a lot there of were some th- uh, there were a few things before that even. Uh, I, I would I, I would expect that, yeah. So that, that's where I want to go with this. Is let's start with your background a little bit. Well, I was the AV nerd in elementary, and this is before middle schools, uh, elementary and junior high school. Oh, so Uh, you brought the card in and... and... Exactly. The the school I went to, the AV department was also the janitor. And um, somewhere around the fourth or fifth grade, the janitor took me under his wing, showed me how to thread a Bell and Howell tape re- a, a Bell and Howell projector and a Wallensack tape recorder, and said, "Bang, you're it." <laughs> Interesting. So you really kind of learned trial by fire, and you learned on some very basic and elementary equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, do you have a musical background as well? I am. Um, I call myself a failed clarinet player. Um, My professional jazz musician friends tell me that means I'm a successful clarinet player. I was going to make that joke, but I thought, oh, I'll I'll avoid it. (laughs) No, it's true. (laughs) Um, For a lot of long time, I still have the instrument, by the way, and I have my father-in-law's instrument, which is even better. Uh, And I used to put it together and try to play it whenever I needed to humble myself. But... I was not good enough to play in the high school jazz band. And since I lived in Colorado, in the Rocky Mountain foothills, I had no desire to wear the band uniform and march around the football field in the snow. (laughs) Luckily, by that point, my reputation had preceded me and bands started hiring me to set up their PAs for them at at gigs, which were usually like dances at other schools. I did not go to my high school prom. I was doing sound for another school's prom with a band that I knew. And, and I would imagine that the PA systems at that point were pretty elementary and rudimentary as well, weren't they? They were. There were two vari- variables. Um, either you had the Pro Gear, which was a Bogan mixer amp, and a couple of, you know, uh, most commonly Electro Voice. We used to call them the Brown Bananas. The, the oh, right. voice LR7s. Mm-hmm. That, that was the high tech stuff. Most of the other PAs were essentially guitar amplifiers with multiple inputs. Like you left out guitar, my favorite. You left out the Shure Vocal Master. That came much later. Oh, you really? Remember, okay. We're talking about the middle 1960s. Oh. I don't think the Vocal Master appeared until the end of that decade, at least. I see. But, oh, yeah. That was a revelation because, you know, it had. Notch filters, five of them, fixed notch filters to cut feedback. Ooh. And reverb built in that made a delightful noise when you banged your knee against the bottom of the cabinet. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, it was mostly uh, custom with a K. It was very big in Colorado because they were headquartered in Kansas. With the tuck and, and roll outside? Oh, yeah. Tuck and oh, roll yeah. speaker ca- columns with either six eights. Four tens or four twelves, or the big guy, which was two 15 inch speakers. And the catalog even said this a police siren horn. Nice. 15 inch diameter re entrant horn that fit in the same cutout that the 15 inch speaker did. Sonic quality be damned. Uh huh. Oh, well, hey, um, in, a, in another interview, we kind of came to the conclusion that until the mid seventies, I wasn't so much mixing as doing damage control. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. Take us on a timeline a little bit at at some point or another shit got real. You decided that this was really what you were going to be doing. Yeah. I was the original game plan is I was going to be a librarian. 
that's what I was going to go to college and become. Uh, How exciting. And, and for a number of reasons, at least not the least of which I had to, uh, due to a medical emergency, come back and help my mom run the family store for a little while. And during that period, one of those bands I knew in high school said, hey, we're going to go to, uh, we're going to play some gigs in Nebraska and Kansas. You want to get in the van with us? And I've pretty much been in the van ever since. I made one last effort to uh, go to college. I transferred and moved out. And I came out to San Francisco State. And I arrived just in time for the entire campus to go on strike. Awesome. Timing. <laughs> and at the same time, because I had already been the sound guy in the last months of the family dog in Denver, I slid right into the same position at the Avalon Ballroom and stayed there until they closed. Ah, okay. So that was your connection to Chet Helms and that whole. Uh, right. Uh huh. The I got the gig in Denver because the sound guy. Uh, well, now that it's legal, we can tell the tale. Um, the imported from San Francisco staffers of the Family Dog in Denver couldn't find any decent marijuana, so they all gave. Chipped in, gave this guy money, and he was going to go back to California and score some good weed and come back, and he never came back. Bob Simmons, later worked at K uh, San, <laughs> was the publicist for the Family Dog. At the I time. remember Bob. Uh -huh. And uh, and he came to me at that time. I you know, in addition to doing sound at a place on Broadway called the Electric Outlet because it was at 220 South Broadway. Um, Clever. I was working for a newspaper, uh, you know, a, an alternative weekly called The Solid Muldoon. And part of the deal is we would distribute the family dog postcard flyers by inserting them in the newspaper. So I went to the family dog out on Evans Avenue to collect that week's flyers. And Bob Simmons said, uh, you do sound, don't you? What are you doing Friday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how gigs were gotten back in those days. Yeah. yeah. And then after Family Dog decamped, Barry Fay, who later became the big promoter in the Rocky Mountain region, mm -hmm. um, continued to hire me. And one time he was uh, at the end of the gig, he was putting together the bank deposit and discovered he didn't have any quarter wrappers. So he paid me in quarters. Nice. I walked out of there with all of my jacket pockets stuffed with 25 cent pieces. Well, I guess it was useful when you had to go do laundry. It's true. Hmm. So so let's fast forward a little bit. You find yourself in San Francisco and, and you slide into the um you slide into the family dog scene. That's mm -hmm. that's quite a quite a scene to slide into. It was. It was you know, I've been told that by the time I got there, it was past its prime. The summer of love had come and gone, and things were getting a lot more commercial. Um, the Avalon still did well, but as Chet always pointed out, it was more a scene than it was a concert promotion in that there's a certain number of people who would show up at the Avalon on a Saturday night because it was the Avalon, and that's where all their friends hung out. No matter who was playing. No matter who was playing. Uh-huh. Hmm. So you were and almost as, background in that sense. And as everyone knows, Chester Helms was not the world's greatest businessman. That's uh, that's being kind, yes. <laughs> and then think about Chet, though. Okay, I, I, you know, eventually I worked for Bill Graham as well. Afterward, and uh, 180 degrees different there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they were complimentary. Bill, sure. I learned about the music business, good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. Chester, I learned how to interact with an audience. Because Chet believed in a almost circular loop between the audience and the performer. He believed in interaction. He thought it was best when the audience was giving energy to the band and vice versa, not just the audience there, okay, you're hot entertain us now that's an interesting concept speak to me about how your position as the live sound mixer 
fits into that whole equation. Because, you know, when when we think about that, the first thing we think about is that energy between performer mm-hmm. and audience. Mm-hmm. And of course, you are part of the performance. And yet you are, you are adjunct. Ideally, I'm transparent. Yes, exactly. So how does that, when you say Chester taught you that, elaborate well, on that. A, a lot of it was the attitude towards the audience. You know, um, you know, Bill Graham, you got an apple and a great show. Chester, you got an interactive experience. And it wasn't just the light shows. Like, for example, when we moved to the Great Highway, rather than playing recorded music to walk in, Chester had a drum circle in the middle of the dance floor (laughs) as people walked in. He wanted to engage them with live musicians from the minute they walked in the door. So the whole thing really was experiential in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That that speaks to a lot of what I think also made that whole scene pretty unique because there was really a lot of, uh, there was less of a division between audience and artist. There's also less of a division between technical staff and band. Yes, that was going to be the next place I segue. Very nice. Was, Good. <laughs> it wasn't the the artists were like on some elevated platform, both physically and you know yeah. socially. Yeah, yeah. They just they just you know they lived in the same neighborhoods we did. They hung out at the same places we did. You'd find them having breakfast at at uh, the Psalms Cafe or whatever. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that is. That is something that really, um, you know, I was I was enamored when I first came to San Francisco with the idea that I could meet these people and interact with them and play music with them. And I think both from a musical perspective and a technical perspective, you're absolutely right. That it's an interesting observation that there was so much um, so much of a really a loop Mm -hmm. of. I, you know, I, I mean, I can I can sound, you know, all hippie woo here and say energy loop, but there really was there was an exchange of creativity. Well, I could go, you know, I could say to a band, hey, you know, I know this sounds silly, but let's try this. And they'd go for it. Mm-hmm. Of course, things were not as codified as they are now. You know, we yeah. were still very much making up doing live sound for rock bands as we went along. Because we were going somewhere where people had never gone before, both in terms of the volume, the size of the audiences. And the turning point in many ways was not just learning how to make it loud, but how to make it loud good. And then to make it economically viable, which means the point at which we learned that, you know, having to hook the speakers up by with a screwdriver and bare wires every night you use the speaker was not a good idea let's put something in there that we can just plug in hey banana plugs Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, banana plugs hubble twist locks what you know yes until the nitric nl4 there was no real dedicated loudspeaker connector that would take big wire well and that leads me to another thing that i think is another aspect of this that is very interesting from your perspective which is the evolution of technology. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously you've been through a lot of generations of evolution here. And as you say, when you started out, there were no standards whatsoever. There wasn't even, you couldn't, you didn't buy a PA system. You bought components or you made components. You more made likely. components. Mm-hmm. You could yeah. not buy a snake. You could not buy exactly. a microphone snake. No, you, you had a snake building buy, party. Yeah. You could not buy a direct box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, we had to make all of those ourselves. Exactly. And, and most of the loudspeakers we were using were just designed for use in movie theaters in the 1930s. So I'll we're take like voice of the theaters. Using, yeah, we're using 30, 35 year old technology already because. Mm-hmm. Those speakers were designed to extract the maximum amount of sound volume out of a 30-watt amplifier. 
<laughs> because, because that was what you in had. In 1935, a 35 watt amplifier was a high power amplifier. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tell my students that, you know, when I started, everything was steam powered. Pretty much. It, yeah. But it wasn't really, but it all had tubes in it. Oh, everything exactly. had tubes in it when I started. And it was really heavy, too. I mean, Macintosh oh, amplifiers. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the standard amplifier from Altec was a 70-watt amplifier Ooh. that was seven rack spaces. No, five rack spaces. Yeah. Five rack spaces, and it weighed 80 pounds. That's 70 watts mono. Mm-hmm. At the Avalon Ballroom, and later when we went mobile with that system, those were Macintosh 275s, which were 75 watts stereo, but they weighed also about 80 pounds. And because they were built for domestic use, they had all the transformers on one side of the chassis. Ah, uh, so, so you'd pick it up and it would all... Yeah, it would. <laughs> uh-huh. So you know, you'd almost break your wrist moving the things. So you know, big solid state amps, which initially meant the Crown DC three hundred, which was also really seventy five watts a channel, but it was a lot lighter. But it was also never meant to be swept around, used in economic, you know, uh, environmentally hostile situations. Mm -hmm. So you bought the amp, and then you had to almost rebuild it. You didn't change the circuitry, but you had to put fans proper connectors on it so you had to build it in a case the phase linear amps which came later were also not meant to be used professionally and if you bounce those around too much the power transformers would separate themselves from the chassis and fold to the bottom of the case yes and especially if you were moving these things around all the time you had constant maintenance issues where you yes. had to almost tweak them every time what one thing that amazes me you know not amazes me, but I find amusing is the concept of a spare amplifier does not exist anymore in PA. <laughs> you know, it used to be if you needed four, you took six. Sure. Because the chances that at least one would go down were excellent. As you say, we were stressing gear that really wasn't designed for the purpose. Um, now, now, you know, obviously things have evolved over time. We're almost to a point now where you don't have to do anything. I mean, you know, uh, you have self-voicing systems and, and you know, mm -hmm. smart technology and whatnot. That's that's obviously been interesting for you. But I wonder, what's your take on how much of those skills you had to learn are still either needed or necessary well for me it saves time sure. uh, you know i no longer have to go in and play familiar music over the pa and tweak a graphic eq and uh you know the number of times i actually you know have suspected that some element of the system was out of polarity doesn't happen anymore because uh -huh. particularly with the mo more modern computer you know configured systems mm -hmm. you can you know like the new system at the great american music hall eli or ted can open the computer and they push a thing and it throws noise bandwidth limited noise through every element of the system and it tells you oh the uh upper mid range component of box number three in the left hang is out of polarity well okay altamont <laughs> At Altamont, there was no single PA system. It was a con it was a corroborative effort on the part of many sound companies in the Bay Area, most of whom had Altec Voice of the Theater based systems. But not everyone wired everything the same way. So I was on one speaker scaffold. <laughs> uh, Dave Schultz, phenomenal engineer was on the other scaffold. And we had, in those days, you know, very simple polarity checkers. There was one box you hooked to a mic cable and you push the button and it went click. And then you would hold this other box in front of the speaker. And if the light was green, 
the cone was moving forward. And if the light was red, the cone was moving backwards. Oh, uh, yes. Uh -huh. And we had, and when we found one that was out of polarity, being Altec Voice of the Theater things, and we didn't have electric <laughs> screwdrivers either. We had to unscrew the back of the cabinet and reverse the wires to the speakers. Oh, time consuming. You don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. But some of the systems I work with now, I don't have to worry about, you know, when I walk in, the system has already been tuned properly. The systems techs that come with systems know what they're doing. In the 70s, it was the Wild West. There were no systems techs. Everybody had their own idea of how it should sound. Mm -hmm. Band writers specified that the band sound tech had to have complete access to all of the crossover points and compressors. So like if your system was set to cross over between the lows and low mids at 400 cycles, and he decided it sounded better at 300 cycles, he had to be able to do that. Ooh. Recipe oh, yeah. for disaster. Mm -hmm. It was. <laughs> a lot of people really did not know what they were doing. There was one reggae, well-known or notorious, depending on your point of view, reggae sound guy who, well, that's a long story. But John <laughs> Meyer was the first guy to figure out that let's make a speaker system that sounds neutral and flat and make all of the electronics a black box. Mm -hmm. In other words, you plug signal in to an amp rack, and the output of that amp rack goes to that speaker, and there's nothing the end user adjustable. Yeah, I can't tell you how many people thought that was a horrible idea at the time. Well, you know, and that that is part of a larger philosophy here where, you know, there are there are those who believe or who purport mm -hmm. that with so many things being automated now with so many mm -hmm. systems being essentially self-tending that a lot of younger people coming up don't learn a lot of those basics mm -hmm. and i think that is that's an interesting it's an interesting paradigm because on the one hand you've learned a lot of skills that you probably don't need anymore, right. but you've also learned a lot of skills that I think enable you to use this technology in a different way than someone who doesn't know those basics. Well, you know, there was a popularly held theory in the 70s also that this particular speaker system is ideal for reggae music. This is this is a good system for folk music. And no, APA should be neutral yes uh if you want your vocals to sound distorted you can do that and there are some genres where that is what they want you know but that's an operator thing i like the you know the current norm okay i'm gonna jump right to my last big gig um uh, i mixed elvis costello at the hardly strictly bluegrass festival oh how nice uh -huh. um being the headline band on that stage, we had to set up and do our line check at about 8 a.m. And the band played at 4.45. So I had some free time, and I walked around and listened to all of the other stages. And the first thing I noticed, and a friend of mine has corroborated this, is that Regardless of genre, if there was a bass drum involved, it was the loudest thing in the mix. Everywhere. It's a problem. Except obviously on the stages where there was no bass drum, you know, like the, where they were doing bluegrass or other, you know, acoustic string band music. And that the contour of the subs was such that everything was very subby. And in the case of the Afrobeat band that played on the same stage we did two bands before that was totally appropriate. Sure. But for a lot of bands, it wasn't. And it's just, so my friend, uh, a friend of mine who I toured with for 12 years and I had lunch the other, he said, usually that means 
if the person mixing the sound is under 35 years of age, the bass drum will be the prominent, predominant thing in the mix, and they'll be working the subs to death because that's the way they hear music. And I understand that. But I was mixing Elvis Costello, whose music really comes from another era. I so, agree. So as soon as I was in control of the system, I actually asked the systems tech, if I turn the subs way down, do you think the kids will hate me? <laughs> and he said, it's your show, mix it. So I pulled down the master fader to the subwoofers until it sounded right to me. And then about two songs later, I looked at where it was. And you know, it's down like 12 dB from where everyone else was mixing it. You're not the first person I've heard say this and you know particularly of course in live but it's 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 endemic in studio production as well yeah. there is a there is an excess of bass and you know it's almost like because we can it's all about the bass yeah and it when... never used to be it used to be about a balance and and of course you know it's almost overcompensating because earlier recordings you know late 60s early 70s the bass was almost inaudible. You know, when you go back and listen mm -hmm. to a lot of the, the remastered Beatles stuff, you know, you, you think, wow, McCartney was pretty good, you know, because you can't hear yeah. it on the originals. Well, another example, you know, and, and a lot has to do with the way things were recorded and mastered, but it's also the way the music sounded live because I was there. I know oral memory is not great, but I heard James Brown live in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And he had two drummers. And the bass drum is not the main thing in the mix. Right. But somehow people managed to dance to it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, once again, it's fashion. And just like that systems tech told me, I would tell the young, you know, a young person, if I were assisting them, it's your show, mix it the way you want. You can ask my opinion, but I'm not going to tell you how to mix your show. Absolutely. And that's, that's totally valid. I think also... Some of it stems from the fact that you came up mixing a lot of organic sounds, you know, jazz, bluegrass. I think, you know, the, the whole idea of trying to be, as you put it, transparent. Mm -hmm. The, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, I tell people that I know 19 year olds who know more about what's going on under the hood of a digital mixer than I do. Absolutely. But they don't have my vocabulary. I have an incredibly broad music vocabulary. Because, frankly, I'm just like that. I like so many different kinds of music. that are, I put my iTunes you know, library on shuffle mode. Your head, your neck will snap between songs sometimes. Yes, because same here. those are all things I like, but they're all very different. Sure, easily. Yeah, always you know, my learned... playlist can go from Debussy to, to Slipknot to uh, mm -hmm. David Grisman, yeah. you know. It's, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like, and I'm learning new things all the time. Like, uh, I knew something about Chinese traditional instruments. But once I started working for Anthony Brown's Asian American Orchestra, which is a mashup of a small jazz big band with traditional Asian instruments. Cool. I learned a lot more doing that to the point where when Anthony's band played at Stern Grove on the 4th of July one year, um, the opening band was a full-on Chinese classical orchestra. Mm. I mean, it was like there were like 32 people on stage wow. and the systems tech from the sound company knew me and knew that I worked with Anthony. He said, I don't have an idea of what this should sound like. <laughs> I think you should mix them. I had never heard this music before. Turns out one of the musicians, there was a part for a traditional jazz trap drummer. And Alan Hall, who I later worked with at the school, uh, got hired literally that week. And he was sight reading this music. Wow. And so 
so I hadn't heard the rehearsal. I knew nothing of the music, but I just, at least I knew what those instruments sounded like. And so I did my best. And at one point, this Chinese gentleman in a bucket hat walks over to me at the mixer and says, um, the pipa is a little loud. Oh, thank you. And I turned it down. I found out after the concert, he was the composer. Good so that that's were... the only thing I did wrong. <laughs> and like I say, it's ears, it's vocabulary. Uh, but I also had the advantage of a, I didn't have to fight the sound system. Now, the first time I worked at Stern Grove in the 70s, I had to fight the sound system the whole time because it was basically inadequate. Yes. Prehistoric is the word I think you want. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think there is, there is a lot of validity to the idea of, you know, when we talk about recording in the studio, go into the room and listen to what it really mm-hmm. sounds like. And, and the same thing for live. I think it's what we're going for here, as you say, is transparency. And I think the fact that we have it so easy now where mm-hmm. I can pull up something and I can say, oh, OK, I can EQ that out. A lot of times people will EQ it out rather than just play with the mic and the mic positioning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think those well, are... I do that in cla- you mentioned classical music. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for many years, classical music was recorded with very few One microphones. Mic. One mic, well, yeah, maybe two. Yeah, a, mm-hmm. a deca tree. If you yes. were, you know, yep. doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they started close miking things, uh, I forget who the composer was, but he's in the control room while they're recording, and there's a close mic on the bassoon. And the engineer keeps soloing it up, and all he hears is, and he's, he says, should I record that? He says, no. He comes in cold at bar number whatever, and the instrument has to be warm for him to play in tune. So leave that mic off until, and he points to the place on the score. Of course, classical recording engineers are expected to be able to read a con- conductor's score. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something I've never been particularly good at. I mean, I read music, but glacially. That's how I read it as well, yeah. Well, and that's that's another thing about jazz, you know? I mean, the, the and, and you know, we could get into that, and that's a whole, a whole other rabbit hole, but I find that a lot of classical music musicians and a lot of musicians who are classically trained through reading music have more trouble improvising than some self-taught musicians? Uh, Not always. No, not always. Um, I worked live shows. I I worked several live shows at the Great American Music Hall with the jazz singer Betty Carter, Mm -hmm. her trio, and the Kronos Quartet, because she had recorded an album with strings at her own expense, because that's the way she did things in New York City. (laughs) <laughs> and when they wanted, she wanted to recreate that show live in San Francisco, she asked Oren Keep News if he could recommend string players. And Kronos, plus the late Mel Graves on double bass, it was a string quintet, in addition to her regular jazz bass player. And they literally nailed the music by reading it. But they can improvise better than most classical musicians, but at no point in the show was Betty comfortable just looking at them and saying, take it. Yeah. You know, they yeah. they were playing what was written and beautiful. Sure. And and you know, they both approaches are are equally valid. Absolutely. Especially for different types of music. But you know, if you talk about jazz, if you talk about bluegrass, most of that is based around people who are self-taught playing by ear um producer well, that's actually not the case so much in jazz anymore well that's true not not with modern jazz but i'm thinking you know older no, forms of yeah older jazz. people yeah yeah but uh I, I i believe it was um my friend ed stasium uh who referred to sheet music at one point uh, as uh yeah fly shit on a paper mm-hmm. you know? uh and and that is you know the attitude of a lot of people who are excellent excellent musicians but Mm -hmm. 
you know, put a piece of sheet music in front of me and I play half as fast as I do without it, you know. Well, but um, the the really best jazz musicians of this generation do both. Oh, and, and do both yeah. well. And and you have musicians now, you know, uh, who, who are mixing so many genres and there's so mm. much talent now. Um, and I think, you know, I and certainly not to disparage any of that. There are some amazingly talented musicians now who can cross genres and there you know there are 15 year olds now that can play circles around so many of us you know it's kind of scary well julian but, lodge good when he was 12 but mm, yeah yeah and and there are there are there's plenty of that you know i i remember a couple of years ago going to a um bass player live event mm -hmm. you haven't lived until you've been in the big room at sir in la surrounded by 400 bass players trying basses at the same time <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm standing around the room there and I'm looking at, you know, kids who are you know, too young to grow facial hair, you know, playing Jocko licks. Right. But they're playing Jocko licks. And see, that's the thing. They can shred. Yeah. Yeah. But they haven't got the vocabulary that Jocko had, even at their age. They haven't got the nuance. I think yeah. that's what it is. And that, again, goes back to the idea of you know, musicians who have come up playing in an ensemble situation mm -hmm. know how to listen to each other. And, you know, I when I taught a recording class, one of the things that struck me right away was that out of my entire class, only two students had ever played in a band, had played mm -hmm. with other individuals and and experienced that interchange and that, yeah. that energy. Instrumental music in schools, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really important. And it it's unfortunately all too uncommon, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, We're lucky here in the Bay Area, but I know places where, nope. Uh, well, obviously, I work at a music school, so, you know, I'm involved with that all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try, you know, the, there's, you know, there's two d divisions of the school. There's the jazz school, which is a community music school, which means pretty much anybody can come, you know, if you can pass the audition and, you know, uh, pay the tuition, which is that bad, go, you know, um, they put you in combos as quickly as possible. At the Stanford Jazz Workshop, where I work every summer, uh, they have 200 middle and high school kids come in for a week. And the first thing they do is they're evaluated by someone who teaches their instrument and they're put together in combos of people who are of you know about the same ability and they play together all week and at the end of the week they get to perform together and for some of them that. yeah yeah and this is a change for them because even the ones who have school music programs there's a certain level of codification that happened in you know, like most high school big bands are still based on what I call the Stan Kenton model. And, you know, it's great. You know, the whole object is to win band competitions. It's not to play great music. Uh -huh. It's to make play music that impresses the adjudicators. And that has always <laughs> bothered me. I mean, they should, you know, I, I wish some of these schools that have, you know, bands like that would at least make them play a dance twice a year. Yeah. Because, you know, because that kind of, that's a different kind of performance. That's why the Count Basie Orchestra was so much more fun than, you know, some, you know, one of the more academically based big bands. It's a, it's almost a, co a competitive thing versus going back to what you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the energy interchange with the audience. Yeah. You know, you, you, you know, I mean, now bear in mind, I know those competitions are really important to get the parents involved. It's like sports. Sure. It's it's just another sport in the sense that band parents are just as serious as soccer moms. Absolutely. Absolutely. If not more so. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, and it's a model, but it's not the only model. The problem is there's so few places for people to even go out and play for free in public. And yes. the ones that are, 
you know, like street fairs and stuff, you have to deal with event planners. And that could be a whole nother three hour discussion. You know, having, having worked with a band that played big corporate parties for over a decade, uh, I have an interesting uh, perspective on event planners. <laughs> and I, I, I'm assuming they don't include too many kind words. No, there are a couple of them that are really good. No doubt. I admire them. Mm -hmm. But there's an awful lot of ones who are every dime they don't spend on entertainment and production is another dime that stays in their pocket. Well, hence the evolution of the one person DJ show as opposed to a oh, band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why should we hire a band? When this guy can show up with a laptop and a hard drive and provide any kind of recorded music that's ever been done for the last 75 years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at any volume. Well, and even you know, the performing musicians, you know, you have you have the ability now to be a one person band. You know, you can busk with all your backing tracks, mm -hmm. and looping machines and whatnot. And I think that has definitely changed the the well, texture and the tenor of music and its audience interaction. That corporate party band I played for, worked for, the leader used to say they were kind of the Burger King of bands. We could, without bringing any additional people, provide pretty much anything you wanted because we had classically trained string players. Mm -hmm. If you wanted someone playing Mozart or Beethoven during co the cocktail hour, they could do that. The rhythm section, the sax player could do all your you know, smooth jazz for cocktails. And then we could do the full on earth, wind and fire with fiddles, R and B dance show. But, you know, but now you just hire one guy with a computer and you got all of that. Bunch of MIDI files. Yeah. Even if you want, even if but you it doesn't look player. nearly as good. No, it but. doesn't. And, you know, that's what I think. That's what saddens me a little bit is that you've lost that that spontaneity of the musicians playing off of each other. Well, you're also now into like probably third or fourth generation of people whose relationship to music is very different than it was for people in the 60s. Absolutely. Um, That's a whole other In the 60s, <laughs> well into the 70s, going out to hear live music was at least in San Francisco, um, a central part of the social life of a whole bunch of 18 to 35s. Yes. On Union Street in San Francisco, between Octavia and Fillmore, in 1969, there were 22 places that presented live music, at least on the weekends. Now, it might just be one guy with a guitar, or it could be a whole band. But literally, you could walk up and down that street, and you got a smorgasbord of live music. Yeah, that um, that whole paradigm has pretty much vanished from most places. Well, they have 105 channels of cable television plus streaming. Uh, another thing, though, is the social aspect of that scene, of course, was to meet to meet romantic partners, and the changes in the California liquor laws also affected that. <laughs> You know, the, the rigid enforcement of driving while intoxicated, which is a good thing, really put a damper on a lot of those venues. Interesting. Hadn't thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Do you ever wonder why, uh, even when, when smoking was still legal in bars, you kids, the kids who watch this wouldn't even understand that. Uh, at one point in California, bars stopped handed, handing out matches with the name of the bar on them. Ah, because they didn't want someone to have that in their pocket when they were pulled over? Uh, or involved in an accident. Because uh, in California, we have what is known as the third-party liability law. Uh, yes, where the bartender is liable if... Correct. The bartender and the bar owner. Ah. Yeah. Oh. So, hmm. that, yeah. All, yeah. You know, there's, you can't separate it from the social aspects. Absolutely. The cultural shift goes hand in hand with, uh, and, and, you know, moreover, not just that, but the, the entire role that music plays in people's lives has become much different mm -hmm. now and much more of a background aspect. And, you know, we're competing for, for eyeballs in so many different ways mm -hmm. now than we were back then. But I still think there's a, there's a loss there 
of the idea of what people learn through playing music together. Mm -hmm. And I think even for you as a sound person, understanding, when you talk about having the vocabulary, understanding that dynamic is mm -hmm. really intrinsic to being a good engineer. Well, well, you know, you have to, like I say, the vocabulary is important, but it's also important to understand that what the musician wants to accomplish might not be what sounds good to you. Mm -hmm. um, when the Great American Music Hall started booking punkish rock bands, you know, the stage volume would be such that it would be difficult for me to get the vocals on top of the mix, which is my first, you know, my first inclination. Mm -hmm. So I would, at the end of the song, I would literally go to the stage and not accusatively or just, you know, I would just ask, how important is it to you that the audience understand the words? You know, because I'm having trouble getting the vocals clear. And in at least half of the cases, they say, no, it, that's fine. You know, it's sure. you know, we'd rather have the guitars that loud and the vocal be in there somewhere. Yeah. And then there's people, then there's, you know, in the singer songwriter thing, you have to, you know, they want people to understand every word because they have slaved over those words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Except for, of course, a uh, one well known singer songwriter uh, at the Great American Music Hall shows over. I'm back at the mixer, you know, finishing up. And this woman walks up to me and she says, I pretty, much, I really kind of enjoyed the concert, but I was really having a hard time understanding the words sometimes. And literally, as if on cue, the performer is walking out because the music hall, the mixer is right next to the exit door. Mm -hmm. And he's walking by and he hears her. And he walks over and says, well, ma'am, I just want to help you understand that I'm from Texas and I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah so there you have it it's part of your total music experience absolutely absolutely that would have been kinky friedman would it no it wasn't <laughs> oh, okay I, I do remember one of those shows that was an interesting one uh well i know that the first time kinky friedman played at the great american music hall his band was opening for commander cody and his lost planet airmen Mm -hmm. And the music critic for one of the then two daily newspapers informed the club that he would not be reviewing the show because of the offensive name of Kinky's band. The Texas Jew Boys. Exactly. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, purveyors of such songs as uh, Asshole from El Paso and oh, They yeah. Making Jews Like Jesus Anymore. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Asian American bass player was referred to on stage as their Southern Slope. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Kinky's but, a brilliant hey, author, by the way, as well. Oh, no. Uh, mm -hmm. The the longest serving owner of the Great American Music Hall, Tom Bradshaw, now lives in New Zealand, is a huge fan of Kinky's uh, you know, detective fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's some quite good stuff out there by him. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I want to touch on one other thing with you, because you've been involved in live sound for so long. And that is the um, the issue of hearing conservation, which goes back again to our discussion about uh, things being too loud, et cetera, et cetera, because now we have so much power. It's so it easy is, to hurt people. Well, we can. Um, two things. Um, one of the two best career moves I ever made as a live sound guy is I started wearing hearing protection in 1968. Wow. I was doing rock and roll shows at the Avalon Ballroom on weekends. And I was helping a guy record chamber music in Berkeley midweek. Oh. And I could not show up to record Haydn with my ears still ringing from Sunday night. No doubt. Uh huh. So I got rubber earplugs. I was probably one of the first kids on the block with the molded, you know, with the custom molded earplugs. Mm -hmm. I'm probably into my seventh set of molded earplugs and they tell me these will last longer because they're silicon 
because yeah. the previous material would sh- dry up and shrink and wouldn't fill your ear canal anymore. Mm-hmm. The other, the other one of those two best decisions was to not, when the Avalon Ballroom family dog clothes moved to LA and go to work for a very well-known glam rock act. <laughs> mm-hmm. I stayed in the Bay Area and went to work for a folk rock band called Lamb. I remember that. Managed by Bill Graham. Mm-hmm. And the piano player in that band was also playing on Monday nights in a big band at the Great American Music Hall. And he came to a lamb rehearsal and said, I'm playing at this new club in the city. And they were new then. Uh, And the sound really sucks. If you come down and do, if you come down and help the fix the sound for us, I'll give you half of what I'm getting paid. At that time, the band was getting paid $20 each and two drink tickets. Ooh. Well, this was a big up thing because prior to that, the same group of musicians had been renting the rehearsal space at the San Francisco Musicians Union building. Uh huh. Because these are all guys who had steady gigs most of the week, like in the bands at the uh, Geary Theater, you know, the pit bands. Yeah. Or the hotels. Yeah. And they got together on Mondays to play their own music. So instead of paying rent to the union, they cut a deal with the union that they could play in public at a club, get paid less than union scale on three conditions. One, no admission could be charged. Two, no recordings would be made. And three, no radio broadcasts would be made. Sounds so, like a deal with the union. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, there's no way the union could make money. And um, so after several weeks of this, one of the owners of the music hall came to me and said, uh, we kind of like what you're doing with the sound here. Uh, we've got Hampton Hawes and Bill Evans coming in in the next couple of weeks. Uh, would you like to do it? 48 years, eight months and change later, I was still working for them. Yes, indeed, and that's yeah, through, a, that's an interesting several room. changes of ownership. Yeah, and and several changes of sound system, no doubt as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the sound system I walked in on was a low impedance input Sure Vocal Master head and two Electro Voice Century Four loudspeakers. A lot of people don't remember those. It was a three way horn loaded system originally meant as a large studio monitor. Wow. Holded horn the art for the late 60s, though, right? Radial horn, mm-hmm. T350 tweeter. Yep. Yep. And State of the yeah. art for the day. So mm-hmm. the first thing I bought was a snake so that I could at least move the mixer out to where I could actually hear the band, because initially I was mixing side of stage. Which, by the way, mm-hmm. is where the sounds, the mixing, the mix, it wasn't a board, it was a mixer at the family dog in Denver was. Mm-hmm. It was stage left. It wasn't in the room. Interesting. Where Monitor Beach would be now. Exactly. And it, by the way, it wasn't, it, strangely, it wasn't an Altec mixer. It was a Harman Kardon PA mixer. Nice. They didn't make them for a long time, but mm-hmm. it was, it had, it had features that the Altec didn't have. It still only had one bass and one treble knob for the whole output. Hey, what no more channel EQ, no <laughs> channel EQ, but it had a high pass filter. Uh huh. Nice. Yeah. So, so corollary to that, how has it changed for you having more musicians on in ears? Um, or has it changed? It hasn't changed for me because if there's in ears, most of the time someone else is mixing the monitors. I've spent most of my time at front of house. Well, but I'm thinking of stage sound because you have oh. less spill from the monitors and whatnot. Oh, that's that's huge. Mm-hmm. But not as much of a factor for me now because most of the shows I'm mixing um, are not that loud. Uh-huh. Now, there was a big difference between Elvis Costello in the park outdoors and Elvis Costello the night before at the Great American Music Hall. I can imagine so. Uh, because Elvis does not do in-ears. 
Yeah. And, and his monitors, he was very pleased with them. So was his monitor engineer. And, but there was so much of his monitors audible in the audience, spilling and coming off the back wall. But I've dealt with that before. Uh -huh. Sure. And so basically, I know that everything from 400 cycles down on the voice is going to be there. I just have to fill in the gaps. So <laughs> in the house, you high pass the mic channel, you boot, give it some presence. Sometimes you reverse the polarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's something yeah. I learned from Fred Cadero. You know, before you get radical with the EQ, sometimes yeah. just reversing the polarity with the polarity, sure, mm -hmm. will make a huge difference. Yes, and sometimes it'll make no difference at all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, we have all sorts of test equipment, but these still win, Indeed. which is why you have to keep them working. <laughs> Which will lead me to my last question for you. Mm -hmm. Since you have all this experience and are educating subsequent generations. Here's the point, though. I'm not teaching people who want to be sound people. I teach musicians. I'm One way you can look at it is I'm trying to make the world safe for sound mixers one musician at a time. But what I'm teaching, uh, I'm teaching them the basics, you know, the nuts and bolts. This is a cardioid microphone. This is a super cardioid microphone. This is a bi-directional microphone. And why that one of the above might be the best for you. You're going to be, you might not become a star. You might be doing sound for yourself at a wedding with two speakers on a stick. I want you to know how to do that in the best, most effective way possible. But the most important thing I teach is how to interact with sound people. The realization that musicians and sound people often refer to the same thing using different jargon. So true. So I'm trying to give them a Rosetta Stone. You know, it's like, yeah, one of my you know, this sounds boxy. Well, what does that mean specifically? Or my all-time favorite, Tom Waits. I want my monitor to sound like it's got chapped lips. <laughs> what do you do? You think about it. Chapped lips. Yeah. He's worried about sibilance, maybe. So you adjust the EQ for that. Mm -hmm. um, but also etiquette. Know where you live on the food chain. It's unfortunate, but true. If you're the opening act, you play by a different set of rules than the headliner. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, don't buy a new piece of equipment for you. Don't buy a new stomp box the day of the gig and, and plan to use it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and don't cut the, the microphone. And now I'm going to show you why you don't cut the microphone. <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just stuff that sound people just take for granted that musicians know and they don't. That's interesting because I think that goes back to my question earlier about the basics. Mm -hmm. And because there is, there are so many shortcuts available now. Mm -hmm. And while I think that's a great thing in terms of making it easier, I think that it cuts down on people learning that vocabulary that you're mm -hmm. talking about. And that vocabulary mm -hmm. is absolutely essential. Well, one of the great things about the school I teach at is it's a jazz conservatory. The object, you know, well, there's the, the community school and then there's the conservatory, which is a degree granting institution where you get a bachelor's degree in music performance. So we're trying to we're trying to produce people who can make a living as musicians. And we all know mm -hmm. how hard that is. And one of the things that they are taught is yeah, there it's a jazz conservatory, but they also are exposed to Indian music. You know, roots Americana music. You know, because you never know. Uh, Paul McCandless from the group Oregon, which I've um, on record as saying it was my all-time favorite group in the world to mix. Uh, played with Bela Fleck. He just slid right into it, you know, just, you know, because he, from Oregon, he has big open ears. 
He doesn't hate banjos and he could jump into that genre. Um, a lot of young jazz musicians don't know that when they first went to New York, a lot of the legends of the 30s and 40s made their living playing in theater orchestras. I mean, Absolutely. Benny Goodman played in the pit band. Well, and musical versatility, I mean, you know, if you talk about the session musicians of the 60s, you know, most of them came up from jazz mm -hmm. and were then playing pop music, you know, mm -hmm. and and I think that, you know, that really touches on the idea of not being a jazz musician or a bluegrass musician, but being a musician mm -hmm. and having this ability to really slide between genres, meld genres. And I think to me, if, you know, I think hearing a new kind of music mm -hmm. usually involves music that melds genres and maybe mm -hmm. maybe genres that you don't think would go together well, but they do somehow. Well, two other things I teach my musician students, or I tell them, I don't know, you know, they, they, I hope they learn it, <laughs> is uh, the ability to play your instrument convincingly and with intent at several different volume levels mm. is a marketable job skill. Dynamics. If you can swing, if you can drive a band from the drums without bashing, that's a marketable job skill. The other thing I teach them is whatever's loudest where the microphone is on stage wins. <laughs> If you're a singer and you, there's uh, there's now once again several generations of singers who have never sung without a microphone. Yeah. I encountered choirs. You know, small choirs, 14 people, they all expect their own microphone. They've never sung in an ensemble without microphones. I find that tragic by the way. Um my my buddy Ted says, yeah, microphone to them, microphones are like forks. Everyone has to have their own. Well, and I think that also takes away from their ability to listen to everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. Blending yeah. is really important. Uh, yes. Yes. But but if you got one of these singers that is. Mm -hmm. What? And you solo up their microphone and the hi-hat is louder than the microphone than their voice. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once again, we'll not name names. I might put it in the book once my lawyers read it. Very <laughs> well-known jazz singer actually came in while I was doing sound for a student recital. And of wannabe jazz vocalists. And she said... And, the, and by the way, in any given jazz vocal class, it's going to be 95% women. Interesting. Which I find sad also because. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she said, some of these young women are singing like they're going, they're afraid they're going to hurt something. Well, and it's interesting, though, because, I, you know, you would think that then they would be able to listen mm -hmm. better and hear better yeah. of what else is going on. But, mm -hmm. you know, which goes back to your original point, I think the idea of being able to listen and mm -hmm. that vocabulary. That is if there's one thing that I would want to teach younger students coming up now, I think that that trumps everything else. You know, it, it, it overrules the technology, it overrules pretty much well, everything. If a musician has worked hard to develop their sound, don't try to change it. Yeah. I know one recording engineer who, I, I kid you not, I think he was trying to make every alto saxophone player that ever came into his studio sound like David Sanford. Mm. You know, he's one of those guys who never got out of the control room, walked in the room, listened. Um, there was a guy... Once again, I forget names. It's been a lot of musicians. There was one group that played the Great American Music Hall in front of like two singer guitarists. And at one point, the guy said, oh, I, I'm going to play a banjo on one song. And it wasn't a high-tuned five-string banjo. It was like a 
big diameter banjo with a long neck, and it was tuned very low. It wasn't plank plank, it was plonk plonk. Interesting. And I walked down to the stage, and I'm standing literally right in front of him and said, play the banjo, please. Oh, okay, it really sounds like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you just can't assume. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, that comes down to an ethos that I believe holds true for engineers and producers alike, which is do no harm. Yeah. You know, we're there in service of the artist. And I've said this a million times, but if you are, whatever role you play in the whole equation of bringing a musical performance to life, whether it's on mm -hmm. record or whether it's live, unless you are that person in front of the microphone, your job is to serve that person and get the best performance possible out of them. Particularly in small venues, after the show, people yeah. come up and compliment me on the sound. Mm -hmm. And my standard response is to point to the stage and say, they do the hard part. Yeah. If they weren't doing what they do well, I can't make it any better. It's true. It's true. I we just try to stay out of the way of the music and serve it as best I can. Beautiful statement. Lee Brenkin, thank you for being my guest. Very well. Cheers. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.